The Unshackled Waves, Episode 73. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back finally for another interview show, and we're lucky to have as our guest today uh, Caleb Stephen. He's the editor-in-chief of a uh, new alternative news website, truthjournalism.com, which is an Australian-based Christian news outlet, which was founded just in March uh, 2017. He's also a freelance writer for numerous online publications such as The Spectator Australia and US-based sites uh, World Net Daily and The Daily Caller. He's also a staff writer for Family Voice Australia, which is a Christian activist group based in Adelaide. He's also worked overseas for grassroots investigative news organisation WeAreChange.org, and he's also a community volunteer in emergency services. So I thought I'd invite him on to today to talk about his journalism and discuss political philosophy. So Caleb, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Glad to be here. So I'll, I'll start talking about, because you're um, quite young, so what got you interested in, in journalism? Well, first of all, being a, a journalist is a very powerful pr profession because you have an amazing amount of power in your hands, the ability to, I guess, set the agenda. Well, that's what the mainstream media tries to do, um, to influence public opinion, you know, belief, um, and to, I guess, set the uh, kind of topics that um, the public talks about for the day, to put it simply. Now, the original role of the fourth estate, as I see it, um, traditional journalism, uh, was to serve as a watchdog on, on government and private wrongdoing, <coughs> excuse me, corruption, waste, fraud, uh, and abuse of power. And um, as some people would know, um, there are three branches of government. You've got uh, legislative, executive, and judicial. Now, the fourth estate was designed to serve as a checks and balance, balances for those other three uh, institutions. And the real mission of journalism is truth, not objectivity. And, and I'll get to why in a minute. Because truth is not impartial. It is, it's not neutral and it's not fair and balanced. And truth is just truth. That's how journalism started off, but over time, and uh, thanks to the rise of regressive leftist ideologies infiltrating the industry, and media outlets becoming bankrolled by um, elitist, um, you know, well, governments and the globalist elite, um, with um, sinister <coughs> agendas, uh, journalists for the uh, last half a century have uh, wrongly been taught that objectivity, fairness, and uh, balance are the ideals um, of this profession. So that is why we now have a generation of journalists who can't tell the difference between truth and fiction. They have been put out of touch with the real reason uh, for what they do and why the concept of journalism even exists in the first place. So <clears throat> being a Christian, I find my faith calls me to seek truth. And that's what the goal of every journalist should be no matter whom it offends, no matter whom it benefits. And, you know, let's face it, each one of us has a worldview or a lens by which we look at the world and everything that pertains to it. So all of us see through the lenses of who we are, what we believe, regardless of whether we, you know, believe in the God of the Bible or not. You know, some people don't claim to be Christians and you know, some are atheists, some are agnostics. But regardless whether you're Christian or not, uh, everybody and you know we some people however pretend that they don't look through that lens they pretend that they leave their personal beliefs at their front you know at their front door the moment they leave their home and go into the office and that isn't true well meanwhile others like to also pretend that they don't impose their religious values on others but in fact, when you come to think of it, every single effort to pass a new piece of legislation is an effort by someone to impose their sense of morality on others. Imposition of morals is a two-way street. 
The question is, will good values or bad values prevail? Will we choose to walk in the light or will we choose to walk in darkness? Will we accept fables or speak the truth? And that's the question. And that isn't just true of um, public policy and politics, but in our everyday lives, uh, whatever we do, it is thus with that frame of thinking that uh, we approach journalism for applies as much to this profession as anything else, perhaps more so because, you know, the expectation to be truthful is very high. The public expects a lot of us journalists, they expect us to report truthfully and we let the public down when we don't do so. <clears throat> and real journalism isn't rewriting press releases. That, that just tends to be what the leftist mainstream media thinks it's the be all and end all of, you know, their reporting today. And it also isn't about libelous and sensational celebrity gossip. It isn't majoring on little factoids or capturing sound bites and then, you know, misconstruing them later on to make it sound, make what somebody said sound like something they didn't say. That's that seems to be the bane of journalism today. You know, misconstruing people's statements to push an agenda. And it's not that pushing an agenda is necessarily a bad thing, but the th the fact of the matter is here that they not open to dissenting opinions and they crush those dissenting opinions the moment they they get any um you know attention in the media and i think that's a big problem so you know people uh, as george orwell wisely said he said journalism isn't printing what someone else doesn't want to d d does does not want printed everything else is public relations and so i think real journalism is investigative, it's thorough, it's intrepid, it's accurate, it's hard hitting, it pulls no punches. It's not It's not there to entertain. It's, it's dangerous and it's daring, it's cold and it's hard and it's real. And it seeks the truth regardless whether, you know, it's going to offend somebody or it's going to benefit them. And it's all about looking at facts in light of truth. So that's basically my, you know, my view of what journalism is. And I think no, it's a very, um, I guess, grave responsibility holding the media uh, in your hands and, you know, having that power to influence, you know, you know, others. Because let's face it, when during the election um, in, last November um, in, in the US, the mainstream media was trying so hard to convince the uh, public that Hillary Clinton was going to be the winner, that Donald Trump was a complete uh, loser and that he had no place in politics. They were really pushing that agenda and they were so convinced of it. They were rigging the polls. Uh, they were doing everything they could to try and stop Trump from being elected. They were setting the agenda of the day. They were making they were, and shaping public opinion and they thought they were going to win and they were so wrong. And it was a very dangerous thing because all their reputations are at stake and, and they lost their reputation as well. And I think over time, so many media organisations have gone that way. They've su succumbed to this idea of <clears throat> pushing a leftist narrative and it just doesn't end up, you know, working out quite so well. Uh, I think the, the greatest uh, uh, crime of the, the mainstream media is uh, uh, not so much misreporting, but omitting uh, facts that they, they don't like. And that's what you're talking about. Journalism should be uh, tr uh, truth. And that's and that yeah. people are starting to wake up that they're not getting the full story. Mm, yeah, sometimes the, the, the bigger problem there can be definitely omitting the facts. And I forgot to mention that. But yeah, omitting facts is also, you know, one of the bigger problems there when they don't report the full story or both sides of the story, only the story they think that they, that they think needs to be put out there. Um, because it's part of their agenda, their their narrative. Oh well, it's 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 why us uh, are in the alternative media because you know we're we're seeing this and a lot of other people are waking up to it as well. What now? Can I ask you what is your dream goal of your journalism career? What would you really like to do? Well, I see it as. <clears throat> doing what I'm exactly doing right now and that's just reporting on truth and continuing to do that and you know trying to get you know bigger into bigger platforms to spread it and you know get more people to read it and I think you know if it, it convinces just one person to and challenges their thinking that it's you know well worth the effort um, 
I don't really have any lofty aspirations of necessarily being some TV star, you know, but I think, you know, people like Andrew Bolt, what they're doing is quite commendable. And, you know, we've got many great commentators out there, you know, uh, you know, we've got Matt Miranda Devine for the Daily Telegraph. You've got Mark Latham with his Outsiders show. You've got so many other people like that. And I think, you know, I'd like to become a respected voice, which people can trust for the news. And I'm finding nowadays that <clears throat> people are turning to individuals as the source of their news. You just look at Twitter, for example. It's like a powerhouse of news. And you can follow one particular person. I, I'm not sure what you know, but in the US, a lot of people follow like Mike Cernovich, for example, who was a nobody blogger um, during you know, um, the lead up to uh, the Trump and Hillary showdown and ultimately Trump winning there. But he was reporting and breaking on big stories that CNN refused to cover. And it's the way with so many other journalists in my experience that they've risen to great heights and, I guess, you know, become better people for it and expanded in and, you know, I guess, improved in the way they've done things because of those experiences and, um, yeah, I guess become over time a trusted news source that people can rely on for their daily news because people, quite honestly, um, are losing faith in the traditional dinosaur media, the mainstream media, as we know it. And I think, quite frankly, that it's dead. Um, people are leaving in droves. They're going to Breitbart, they're going to Infowars, they're going to World Net Daily, they're going to Drudge Report. And here in Australia, websites like The Unshackled and mine and you know, so forth. So I think there's a mass awakening happening there. And I think I'd like to be a part of it. Yeah, it's... Uh, certainly, I mean, you're getting published uh, quite widely already, which, uh, which is great. So you're, you're certainly on the, the right path. Now, let's uh, talk about your political beliefs. Now, um, is it fair to say that you would call yourself a, a social conservative? Well, as Andrew Breitbart would say, he didn't like being put in boxes, you know, split into little factions here and there. You've got right versus left. You've got conservative versus libertarian. I'm not a conservative. I don't see myself as a conservative because conservatives, it's got this connotation that seems to, to me to be all about trying to save the existing values that we have, you know, traditional values, um, instead of reclaiming them. How about we try and take back some of these things instead of trying to save, you know, what precious little left we have. I don't think that's the kind of approach we're needing to have here. We need to be trying to reclaim uh, and I think in many ways I'd call myself a revolutionary. I don't want to be one who sits back and just tries to you know save what's actually burning down. You want to go there and fight back and you want to you know be active and, and, and do those things and I guess you know try and um, gain some ground because quite honestly the lefties are pushing pretty hard and I think it's about time that we I guess, resorted not necessarily to the same spite and hateful tactics that they have, but I guess the same uh, fervour and um, courage and determination uh, and, and fortitude that they have in, in the culture wars because they seem to be relentless. And um, I, d I don't necessarily think that um, some some so-called conservatives and whatever else you want to call, call yourselves are in this are the same way so i think we just need to if we are really uh, to uh, i guess reclaim the culture we've got to start doing something and um you know whether that's being an influence in the media or being uh, an activist in a or a member of a political party i think you know just do something and and, and get out there instead of being a bit of an armchair warrior, I guess, you know, like some of those lefties, keyboard commandos. Yeah. Uh, what do you sort of say to the, the argument that's put forward that uh, people like you and me to a degree are on the, the losing side of progress, that you just can't stop this, uh, as they see it, this new era of progress? A new era of progress. That's how they describe it. Mm. Well, I don't think progress is measured by how we see it necessarily, because quite frankly, everybody's opinions are a dime a dozen. 
it's it, we measure progress true progress in society by um, in the light of truth you know so many things just because the majority believes something to be right doesn't necessarily mean it's right you know many people thought Hitler was the greatest thing the world had ever seen and they were wrong and I think it's the same thing today we have so many social justice warriors so many leftists so many liberals whatever you want to call them so convinced that we're moving towards progress when literally the world is falling apart because we're seeing regressive ideologies such as feminism which spreads like cancer we're seeing islam overtaking this country i mean you know i'm sure many of your listeners here would have heard about the um, foil terrorist attack in sydney just the other day you had these um uh, this Muslim father and son, two, two, two pairs of them, in fact, um, plotting to take a plane out of the sky of a bomb. I don't see that as being progressive. I don't see allowing unregulated numbers of Mus badly assimilated Muslim refugees with no respect for Judeo-Christian values into this country. I don't see that being a progressive thing. I see it as a regressive thing because we look at the results and it's all about looking at the results. It's not about measuring it by how we see things on the surface, whether it's, it, the thing about lefties is it's all run about run by, they run everything through emotion. <clears throat> you know, it feels good to be helping the refugees. Well, how about we go beyond emotion and start looking at real facts and start looking at consequences of actions? You know, the, the open borders policy, for example, in Germany, and I've covered this quite a lot. It didn't quite work out so well, did it? Angela Merkel opening the doors wide open to what was it? Two million more or even more of these, you know, African, mostly male migrants who had come across the seas for one purpose and one only to dominate Germany and to turn it into a country of the Islamic global comfort. So that's not progressive. That is regressive. It is it is selling out your own country to an enemy. And I think in Winston Churchill's, uh, you know, words of advice and I guess uh, rallying calls to the uh, people of his day during the Battle of Britain, uh, just as important um, as it is to, as they are today, because, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give up in his fight against the Nazis. And I think we are, we are being too kind in, and I guess, <clears throat> I think it's Stockholm Syndrome that the, the West is really, um, I guess, uh, manifesting and um, succumbing to because we seem to be sympathising with the enemy, I guess, and, and not um, trying to identify what they're trying to do. We're not being uh, smart. We're not being wiser serpents here. We're not figuring out what their next move is. And... Again, it's all about emotions. Oh, you know, all these poor refugees dying, you know, on, on the sand, like they were using their propaganda uh, photo of that child. It turned out to be a fraud. And there's so many other ones. And these are the lefties. They're just using these uh, emotional blackmail tactics. I don't see that as progressive. Progressive is measured. Progressiveness is measured in the light of truth. How are we moving um, together as a society? In what direction are we going? Are we going up? Are we going down? Are we going over the edge of the cliff to our own destruction? And I think we just look at everything in society. Fatherlessness is a big problem. The f the feminism, a, a leftist ideology, has stripped men today of everything that is masculine. Uh, boys can no longer be boys. Uh, you've got uh, men being encouraged to <clears throat> be transgender and vice versa, you know, go into the women, women's bathrooms, use, use the female toilets. We've got that sort of thing happening. And then we wonder why we're in the big mess that we are in. That's not progressive. And we've got abortion, you know, it, <clears throat> on the surface, <clears throat> people think it's a convenient thing, but they don't, they fail to realize that somewhere down the track, every woman that's had an abortion is suffering even though it's not initially, you know, after the fact, and same as men as well. And society is broken because of every one of these immoral things that they're doing. Um, I don't see that as progressive. 
Uh, certainly the, the left's uh, grand vision for society as they see it. Uh, a, a lot of people uh, are looking at it and uh, it's not working out uh, exactly the way that you know, they, were, they were told it would. You, know, you mentioned obviously the open borders policy of Europe which they've tried to suppress all the news about but luckily the, the, the truth has, has gone out and a lot of people are waking up to some, uh, all of this social re-engineering that's going on uh, here in, well, not just in Australia, but throughout the, the Western world. Now, um, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about your family background because your father is uh, Joseph Stephen, who's been a candidate for the Christian Democratic Party in South Australia and is also a organiser for them. So it's fair to say that um, your upbringings influenced your your politics and your, your values? Yeah, def definitely. Uh, I mean, f even from the age of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 11, I was helping with political campaigns and being very much involved in that sort of thing. So this is nothing new to me. I've been active in that area for quite a long time. And I think it's important, you know, the, if you've got children, it, you know, it's best to get them involved, um, you know, as young as possible. And that way, you know, when they grow old, they're not going to, uh, I guess, uh, depart from your teachings, as, uh, to, to borrow some words of scripture. So, yeah, definitely uh, having that experience has shaped who I am and what I do today, I guess. Now, obviously, the Christian Democratic Party, it's one of, uh, one of the many uh, parties on the right, and there's been a lot of talk about that the right in Australia needs to unite. I mean, uh, Pauline Hanson's come back on the, the political scene, but probably the, the major effort to unite the right is Cory Bernardi's Australian Conservatives. Do you think that the right you know, should unite, given that especially that the Liberal Party is losing its way uh, quite a bit, both federally and at, at the state governments? Do you, do you see that as important? Yeah, well, my opinion for a long time has been that the right should definitely unite. Um, I think we'd all like to see that. Maybe some people wouldn't because they think, you know, egos get in the way and they think they're always right and you're you're wrong. So that seems to be a bit of a problem, I think, in uniting. And, uh, I guess one of the bigger problems standing in the way of u unity there. Um, I think the progress that has been already made with, you know, family first and... Um, you know, what, what was it, um, DLP? Yeah, um, Rachel Carling Jenkins here in Victoria. Uniting with um, Bernardi and, you know, the two, uh, the two upper house MPs here in South Australia, uniting with uh, Bernardi's party. I think that was a very wise decision to make there because at the end of the day, they're all singing from the same song sheet anyway. And I think uh, the more this happens and, um, you know, the more people decide to join... Uh, you know, Corey Bernardi's party, that's, a, that's actually a good thing because I think a lot can be accomplished through unity rather than being split into different groups and doing your own thing. I think that you need, you need to unite um, for a common goal to, def to defeat um, and uh, fight off a common enemy, which is, you know, the regressive leftist ideologies that have infiltrated both the Labor and Liberal parties and obviously the Greens, while well, they're lefties from the ground up, from the inside out. So... I think they're pretty much unsalvageable. But I don't think the Christian Democrat, Democratic Party would be um, <clears throat> willing to unite with Australian Conservatives um, because for the one reason that they're unashamedly Christian. Now, I know many other Christians would say, you know, oh, but Australian Christ Conservatives is doing this and this and this and this and this. But at the end of the day, um, you know, and obviously <clears throat> some people aren't Christians in Aust Australian Conservatives, but... In the Christian Democratic Party, I think to them being unashamed about the fact that they're, you know, exclusively Christian, unashamedly Christian, um, I think that's very important to them. And I think that would be the biggest problem uh, standing in the way of, um, I guess, uh, joining the two parties together. But I think, you know, if that can be united on policy um, where possible, um, if they can, you know, stand together, um, on the same issues and you know provide the same responses and i think that uh, and on that note i think it's very important to mention that you know when the left sees you know different groups in the right um 
arguing, you know, with infighting um, <coughs> and disunity among each other, I think that causes great problems because it shows that there's a lack of unity on our side, there's a lack of agreement um, and, you know, we don't want to be replicating what the left is doing. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, if the right can be unified, that's, that's definitely a great thing, but I can always see problems standing in the way of that. But as with everything, you know, there's always a problem, problem standing in the way of unity at some point. Yes, po uh, politics, it's, uh, as you mentioned in your answer, there's always a lot of egos in politics and it's hard to uh, put those aside as well as minor differences for, for the greater good. But yeah, it's certainly um, been impressive, the, the progress that yeah, Australian Conservatives uh, has made so far in, in your home state and uh, here in Victoria uh, as well. Now, I wanted to get your thoughts on some of the other emerging political philosophies uh, in, in the West. Um, so I still identify as a libertarian, even though there's lots of libertarians who, as the expression goes, want to tear up my libertarian card for various reasons. What's, uh, what's your opinion on libertarianism? Personally, I think it's one step away from anarchy if you're not careful because I know big government's a bad thing. I'm, not, I'm definitely not for uh, big government because, you know, this is a whole other topic for another day, but there's so many reasons wrong about big government. But having said that, government by itself is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, being from a Christian point of view, um, government is an institution of God. Uh, there's so many passages in, 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 in scripture that back that up. Um, and so where possible and uh, where government isn't standing or contravening, um, standing in the way of or contravening um, the principles and, you know, the ordinances of God, I think it must be respected in society. And, you know, government is there for very good reason. Um, everybody needs to have an authority over them at some point, and I think some people don't like that. Um, that's where we get anarchists and you know all kinds of different groups who say that uh, there's the anarcho capitalists, for example, who try to, I guess, start their own world outside of government. Uh, any kind of um, any semblance of government, they don't want to have accountability there, and we do need that as a society because at some point. People have to be held to, you know, some sort of moral standards. We do descend into complete chaos, um, uh, as we see in some parts of the world, like um, Venezuela, for example. Well, that's uh, that's hardly a, a libertarian, uh, uh, most people would say. Well, I know libertarians believe, you know, various different things, but for myself, you know, I think there's good and bad points about libertarianism. But, you know, for example, I mean, some libertarians think uh, same-sex marriage, well, you know, let people love who they want to love, you know, uh, let people do what they want to do in the bedroom, things like that. But I think we have to look beyond that and see that sometimes people's own personal choices do affect others in society. Um, and personally, I think same-sex marriage does create a lot of different problems. It's a slippery slope. You can have polyamorous marriages you can have polygamy, you can have bestiality. I mean, by its very nature, you can't have children either, not naturally. So, and then there's all these children being left without mothers, or fathers, vice versa. In fact, even both parents if they're abandoned. So that creates big problems for, for society, fatherlessness. Um, you now we have had examples of, um, I guess, um, you know, children who have grown up in in um, cup, um, homes where uh, of um, same-sex couples and, um, you know, they, they've they lacked the, um, um, the care and comfort of, you know, a father, for example, uh, or, or a mother, you know, vice versa. So I think, you know, saying that <clears throat> people can love who they want to love and things like that, um, I think, you know, we need to dig deeper than that and um, 
you know, start looking at the effects it does have on society because, you know, those effects are very real. Uh, libertarians, in my experience, they're a very diverse group. There's, yes, those who, as you say, favour uh, anarchism. There's some who want small, uh, limited uh, government. Uh, there, there's a, libertarians, as you or as I describe them, who are all obsessed with uh, sex and drugs. Uh, I've they drive me crazy as well. But there's there's definitely libertarians who you get along with. I mean, we see eye to eye on a, on a lot of issues. I mean, religious liberty libertarians uh, are strong on, which is very important in this day and age with governments trying to crack down on free exercise of religion. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't mean to blanket, um, and that's why I don't like labels, because personally, when I look at labels, I take it at face value in the experiences I've seen, and I think other people do that as well. Um, and, you know, if we start coming out of those labels and, I guess, ex uh, um, expressing where we uh, stand specifically on certain areas, I think it helps to clear up a lot of um, uh, misunderstandings between different people. And, um, yeah, I, for one, don't mean to uh, you know, make blanket statements about um, different, uh, you know, groups and collective, um, you know, thoughts and beliefs like that. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you explained your objections to the philosophy quite well. Um, I also wanted to get your opinion on another emerging political movement, which is the alt-right, which I'm not sure if you've written about this, but I've seen you on social media be uh, quite critical of them. Uh, obviously, you're, you know, um, half Asian, so you don't sort of like, you know, prejudice against, like, um, as we saw, uh, there, there's the old right are sceptical, they want Australia to be for, you know, only only white people. Um, and you've also been critical of One Nation as well and their opposition to immigration. Can you sort of explain um, you know, how, how you view the old right Well, again, not everybody in the old right um, holds the same beliefs, but in my experience, um, and generally, the old right out is not out there to be principled about any of the arguments um, to actually uh, have um, careful and moderated debate about these things. They tend to like triggering you know, the social justice warriors and the leftists just for the sake of doing it. Um, and like you also mentioned, there are those who call themselves nationalists and whether they're opposed to you know, people who are other than white, um, I'm not entirely sure, but, you know, there are obviously some individuals who are, who say, you know, white is the supreme colour, um, you know, and obviously tend to possess some of the qualities of Hitler, um, you know, in their, in, their, in their, I guess, approach to that type of thing, um, to that subject. But <clears throat> generally, I don't think the, the alt-right is being really effective because we have to respect the fact that in society... We, you know, we obviously live in a democracy. I think we all agree on that. In, an, in, an, in a free society where you can express your beliefs um, openly, um, you know, and I, I do cre give credit to many liberals, you know, leftists, whatever we want to call them, who are very much willing to sit down and have a very principled, uh, moderated and uh, fact-driven and logic-driven discussion. And I think that's a very good thing. Um, I don't think we can necessarily write of particular, you know, movements or people, <clears throat> you know, with a blanket kind of argument or, you know, um, um, you can't just write them off just like that. And I think the alt-right tends to do that a lot. They tend to not be really willing to have uh, any proper discussion. And in many ways, they're just as bad as some factions of the leftist movement. I see them as the you know, the worst part of the right, if you know what I'm saying, so. Yeah, that, that's certainly a bit of my experience uh, uh, as well. They're, you know, uh, they, you all have to, you know, toe this, you know, alt-right line, and if you, uh, you know, deviate from it, then they um, turf you out of the movement, which is, yeah, and there is, 
uh, they don't like me representing the, like, well, being a representative of the alt-right because, like, you know, I have no problem with, you know, Asian or Indian people li living in Australia. So, yeah, they're very, uh, uh, they spend a lot of time sort of, you know, arguing for purity on the internet. But as you said, they're, they're, they don't engage in, in much uh, public, public discourse. So, yeah, you're certainly uh, right on that. And on that note about, um, I guess, different... <coughs> um, ethnicities in in society I don't think that's actually a bad thing I mean many people and they forget that so many migrants have actually helped to um, build the nation that we are today um, because they uh, positively contributed to who we are as a nation and that's not a bad thing if they have respect for the uh, Judeo Christian values upon which this nation was founded upon and are willing to assimilate and willing to build this nation up rather than tear it down, I think that's a good thing. And we've seen so many examples of it. And when I refer to, you know, the Muslims not wanting to do that, well, it's because it's not because of their colour. I don't think that has anything to do with that. I think, you know, many people say, oh, you're racist when you don't want Muslims in the country. I don't think that's racist because for starters, Islam isn't a race. It's a, it's an, it's an ideology. It's a, you know, a, you know, different beliefs, uh, um, that make up that ideology and some of those beliefs are civilised. I mean, you know, for example, beheading people, gay people, you know, as much as I think uh, homosexuality is wrong, according to the Bible, uh, not because I don't love homosexuals, but I think what they're doing to themselves, uh, um, you know, by engaging in that behaviour is detrimental to their own health and you know if you love really do love people you'll tell them the truth about that you know one in nine men in, in australia have have um hiv uh, one in nine homosexual men in australia have hiv and i think you know it's a very dangerous thing but we're digressing here but uh what i'm saying is that yeah some <clears throat> you know beliefs and opinions hold more weight than others and it's got really nothing to do with race in that regard you know we're talking about Muslims. Yeah, I think it's reasonable for you know pe uh, migrants who are coming to Australia to uh, you know have a degree of you know integration, accept Australian values, you know uh, speak English. But yeah, uh, we, uh, which is you know why um, yeah. there has been you know we accept that you know Asians and Indians and before them the the Greeks and Italians have integrated uh, really well. But obviously with Islamic migration, it's been quite a different experience and there have been you know pr problems with it that's right we don't we don't see Indians um, committing terrorist attacks we don't see the Buddhists uh, coming here and blowing up places I mean we could talk about some of the other atrocities of Buddhists killing Muslims and things like that but they're very isolated examples and they happen back in the countries where they came from but they don't go across the seas to come to Australia with the one purpose and this is you know core Islamic ideology to um, wage holy war, to kill the Kufa, which is the infidels, and to capture this country, this land, and, you know, make it as part of their own global Islamic caliphate. I, I don't see any other, you know, religions necessarily doing that. Um, you know, obviously there's rare examples when you have a white supremacist, um, you know, bomber-like, um, the Oklahoma bomber, you know, some, some people like to, you know, use that case as an example of, um, you know, alternate terrorism, where, you know, not involving uh, Islamists. And, you know, the IRA is another one they like to say, you know, the Catholics. But, you know, gener generally, we just look at this last period of Ramadan that's just gone by. What did we see? We saw three major terrorist attacks in, in Europe within the space of three months. And then after Ramadan ended, it, it was like, it was quiet for a period. If terrorism has nothing to do with Islam, well, and, and if Islam is a religion of peace, then why during that so-called peaceful pe um, period did we see so many terrorist attacks? And once it was over, we saw none for a bit. So, you know, we've got to start criticising and, and being sceptical of those kind of viewpoints because 
they're detrimental to society. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly right. I mean, um, and that brings me to uh, my next question, which is how do you see the the current state of the West? I mean, uh, do you view the Trump presidency as a force for, for good? How do you think we're, we're going in, a, in Australia? <coughs> I, th I think um, it, Trump's uh, election was a major turning point, definitely, and so was Brexit. Um, although there's um, some hindrances there, obviously now that, that they're encountering, but you know, I think it was the start of change, change that we really needed to see, and I think it has given some people hope. Uh, and you know, Trump, many people didn't um, have too great expectations of him; they thought he was just as bad as Hillary that he wouldn't carry through with his promises. But over the last six months, I've just been noticing that Trump has really been keeping his word on a lot of the pro uh, original election promises he has made. And I think that's a very good thing. And I think he is beginning to turn around America, you know, for the better. And um, you know, I hope that continues. Obviously, there's not everything about him is necessarily good. And that goes for everybody. Uh, no person is beyond approach and I think some people in the Trump movement you know they they, they just they, they'll, they'll just prostrate themselves just as bad as the leftists would over Hillary Clinton I don't think it's a good thing they need to hold his feet to the fire they need to keep him accountable and you know continue to encourage him in the right direction because you know he's got so many detractors the swamp hasn't been fully drained uh, and there's obviously these uh, you know potentially dangerous individuals out and about with their own agendas, you know, planted inside the Republican Party uh, by the Democrats to, um, you know, be a, a nuisance to, uh, and a hindrance to his real progress that he's really trying to push for in his country. And I think, you know, what he's done in America is a good thing. And my hope is for Australia that uh, we would take some <clears throat> and leaves out of, um, you know, America's book and uh, uh, hopefully in the next election, you know, make wise uh, choices about who we vote in and uh, not, not make the same old rinse and repeat um, cycle that has been, uh, you know, so so common here in Australia where it's, it's almost like one year you've got Liberals, you know, Liberals, uh, Labor, Liberals, Labor, whatever, you know, it's just like one or the other. There doesn't seem to be any kind of um, weighing the different opinions <clears throat> here in Australia and, you know, seeing through the um, propaganda and um, I guess the smoke, uh, the smoke screen kind of stuff that the both the major parties put out. And I, I hope that at the next uh, election that um, the overwhelming majority would vote for, you know, a minor party, you know, uh, you know like the Conservatives, for example, um, and hopefully through that we can see some real change because obviously it's very difficult to uh, push for any real change when you have um, both major parties um, just so stuck deep in self-interest and pushing their own uh, regressive agendas and they're no different to the Greens and uh, some of the you know other leftist parties that yeah leftist minor parties. Yeah, we certainly hope that a, a phenomenon like we like we saw with Trump in the United States can come here. Obviously, he was uh, assisted in the United States because they had a large alternative media presence, which we're trying to to build here. So it's yeah, there's there's still a lot of a lot of work to be done by by us and uh, others in the movement. Now, my uh, final question is: I wanted to ask you about your your volunteer work. It's it's something that you've I've seen you post. You you really enjoy it, which which is great. Now, um, uh, volunteering, um, uh, I've I think it's a really important thing. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, libertarians think it, think is important. Do you think we still have in Australia a strong volunteering spirit? Well, last time I looked at the stats, um, it's, it's in a deep free fall, um, it, well, the state of volunteering. Uh, less and less people are volunteering nowadays. Um, 
I think people are getting more selfish. This society as a whole is getting more selfish. And I think you know, it's also a reflection on other things like abortion, for example. Um, yes, um, you know, for healthy communities, we need to have, um, you know, active participants and, uh, and volunteers. And, you know, in the old days, we had, um, you know, neighbours helping each other out. And it was just something you did. Um, and it comes from, you know, the biblical principle of loving your neighbours yourself. Um, that's something none of us can argue with. Um, it also comes from, uh, you know, all the passages in scripture about doing good to, you know, all men. Um, so I think society has, like a lot of other principles, lost that um, ability to uh, be there to serve other others, you know, your neighbour, um, you know, love your neighbours yourself. I think that's just a fundamental pr uh, principle that we've just lost totally. You know, and, and that's truly reflected in the latest stats where we see as a society that acts of kindness are decreasing and volunteers are decreasing and, um, yeah, it's just in a free fall. I, I think another factor is it is that government has taken over a lot of the, these sort of areas and so there's an attitude that, well, the government looks after that now and... Uh, obviously, government, when they take over something, uh, they're, they're, there's a lot of problems with it, which is uh, which de uh, denigrates things even further. But certainly, uh, you know, volunteering, we, we do want to, to see it increase. I mean, I see it in my, my local community. I'm from, uh, I'd say, a semi-regional town and sort of our uh, CFA uh, as it is in Victoria, is one of the, the pillars of our community and heaps of people help out there and it's a real uh, community uh, cohesion uh, tool which, uh, which is really good, which is why everyone was so so upset with the, I'm sure you heard about it, the, the CFA dispute with the state government. Yeah, definitely. I think government intervention here uh, is, is another big problem uh, and uh, the reason why we're seeing a drop in, in volunteering in general, because I think the government's got an agenda. They want you uh, to rely on them, not a community to be resilient and to help each other out in times of need. Uh, it's something that's you know dates back to biblical times where neighbours always help help each other out, and you know, that's something that's always been a tradition. And the reason why we have these volunteer-based emergency services nowadays, and the government doesn't like that because they see it as, you know, depending upon each other instead of us as a, you know, you're everything, you know, you, you must, um, you know, get your vaccinations from the government, for example, you have to do this, you have to do that, and it's just turned into one big bureaucratic unit. And yeah, it, I think it's a great hindrance. Uh, it, it definitely uh, dissuades people and, you know, is is a, a big barrier to anyone volunteering nowadays because people have this expectation that the government's going to solve it you know i pay my emergency services levy we should have a paid fire state government fire station here for example you know uh, that's just the kind of mentality that I, i've noticed going around quite a lot yeah it's certainly not a not a good development but it's yeah it's definitely good to see you doing your bit to, to change it. Um, that's all we've got time for for today's show. So thank you, Caleb, for, for coming on and having a chat. No worries. It's been great. And, of course, we wish you good luck for the future, and I'm sure that, that will keep in, keep in touch. Yep, sure. Good all right, everybody, that's the, the show. So as always at the end of the show, the usual e uh, reminders apply so if you haven't already please sign up to the email list at the unshackled.net slash subscribe please consider supporting the work of the unshackled by becoming a patron on patreon we've also been uh, arranged some awesome benefits for people who sign up to support us uh, 
uh, or also a reminder that there's uh, unshackled merchandise for sale. You can get that at uprightmarket.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.